for this session is called Ethics, Continuing Education, and Innovation. And it kind of is a play on the continuing education um, programs we, that we have at many universities. And we thought about ethics and in thinking about forwarding, what, what is it that we want people to be learning and thinking about and innovating, and how can we carry that forward? So the session really is about um, learning, uh, sharing our learnings, but, but thinking innovatively and how we can carry things forward. And Willie's agreed to be a discussant on this. Um, Willie, you've agreed to be a discussant on this panel. <laughs> but, but he prefers to sit at his, um, at his seat for now. Yeah. Um, and so we have the, the purpose to explore essential complementary role of education and educational tools in understanding and promoting ethical research practices. And we have some of our panelists who have already been um, up front who, who have another module or another piece that they would like to contribute to this conversation. Susan Zimmerman, who we, we've already met, the Executive Director of the Secretary on Responsible Conduct of Research. Um, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Graham, who we've not met yet formally. Um, she is with the Aboriginal Research Ethics Summer Institute in Carleton University. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you for coming. Um, a very exciting endeavor of Carleton. We have Dr. Karine uh, Jungle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Karine, I, I also have to apologize too, she also has an error in her affiliation. She's with the University of Montreal. From <laughs> our I'm going to make two really nice gifts afterwards. <laughs> And uh, Dr. Sean Haynes has joined us again, and she's, um, Dr. Haynes is an um, educator, and she's going to share um, about uh, Indigenous education methods and, and what she's implying. So I would like to invite Susan up to start. Uh, Susan's going to talk about turning theory into practice, supporting implementation of ethics guidance. Afternoon. Um, I'm really going to talk about my new title is Efforts to Support Interpretation of, uh, or Implementation of Chapter 9. Um, and I won't take up too much time. Um, because all I want to do here is to give you an idea of the different uh, education activities that we've attempted to do since the since the development and the launch of TCPS2. We are well aware of the fact, uh, as, a, as a policy shop, um, that creating the policy is really only step one. Sometimes it seems like everything, but it's, it's, we're very well aware that it's not. And uh, we are also well aware of our responsibility. It's part of the mandate of the panel uh, on research ethics and the Secretariat in supporting it. Uh, to do evolution of policy, yes, but also to do education and implementation. Um, and we take that responsibility very seriously, and I want to give you an idea of what we have done. Uh, that's specific. Some of it specific to Chapter Nine, and some of it um, more general. And um, my aim is not even to get the yellow card. <laughs> <laughs> little competition I have with John. Um, <laughs> this could do it. It's all on the wrist. Um, we're, we've designed uh, our education activities, as I thought about them, I, I realized that some of them are aimed at individuals, some are aimed at institutions, and uh, some are aimed at, communi uh, at communities. Uh, probably the most popular and widely used um, educational tool we have is the Course on Research Ethics, which is an interactive uh, tutorial uh, about the, um, all the general uh, provisions of, t of TCPS, and that's been in place since June of 2011, and I'm happy to say that that is used widely, not only across Canada, some institutions have made it mandatory for graduate students, but we have over 150,000 registered uh, users, So, and that's not because some people have to take it three times, they're only counted once. <laughs> um, I mean, some new institutions have made it an annual requirement, I think, but um, they will only be counted once. But we know that uh, in uh, we have users, registered users, from uh, over 30 countries around the world. So we know there's a need for it. And um, and it is a free resource. I can tell you when the government found out, <laughs> don't charge for it, and, and that it's being used around the world. No, so, oh, why don't we charge for that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, I think we're filling a gap, even though it obviously is 
Canadian-based, um, much of it is just generally uh, useful, I guess, for, as a primer on research ethics. So, um, and we have had a, a module ready. So we did the basic, uh, covered the basic eight chapters um, first off, and then have prepared some other modules, including a module specific to chapter nine. Um, it's been ready, but we have had IT problems which I won't bore you with, so we uh, are continuing to pray to whatever powers that may be um, that it will be ready to be launched in the spring. But that module is, is out there. It is, uh, it, it is ready. And I want to say that it was done through collaboration um, with a group of uh, external advisors, including Cynthia Sturby, so she's Yes, standing right in front of me, so she can tell you what that was like. So we certainly did um, have expert advice uh, on that module. And we have produced a number of webinars, again, some of them um, fairly basic, but one of them specific to, mod, uh, to Chapter 9. And we have an interpretation service, um, and that's more on the individual and institutional level. Anyone can write to us. We got, I'm happy to say that when I... When I first arrived at that office, there was a form that you had to fill out and no one knew where it was. And If you just send us an email now, or give us a call, as sometimes people do, um, and you have a question of interpretation um, about the TCPS, uh, we usually respond to it within 24 to 48 hours at least orally. We will check back in with you. Because um, we sometimes find that things that look very complicated or very simple, once you talk to the researcher or the REB member, um, it's, uh, the question is sometimes quite other than what you would have thought. So uh, we make a point of speaking with you before providing you with a written answer. So we will often be able to give you a sense of our response. These are not responses to, um, I don't like what my REB did, can you give me your opinion? <laughs> um, but we do try to provide, uh, so we're not a, an appeal board, but we do provide uh, guidance on, you know, what are the relevant issues to consider in responding to the question. And that is a very useful, I, I, I say it's useful because people use it. So um, it's a very popular service. And um, we give a written response um, to the individual requester, but we ha also have found that some questions have more general applications. So uh, periodically we will post a series of uh, public interpretations. So we now have a data bank of about 40 posted interpretations. So you know, sometimes if, if you find you have a question, it's a resource to, to check out before you even uh, come to us with the question, because sometimes the answer, you will find the answer there. And I want to say just a, one additional thing, um, that we have a subcommittee now that's been working for a while, and it's not specific to, uh, to Chapter 9, but it's specific to research participants. We have, we too, like REBs, have a community member on, uh, on our panel on research ethics, and like you, we are constrained by the fact that that person can't represent all points of view. Um, and for a long time we were asked, well, what, what are you doing to give a resource to research participants? Our, I think our primary um, goal with TCPS is, our primary audience is really researchers themselves and research ethics boards that, that help them in the gain ethics approval. But the fact remains that there are research participants who we, we could also provide some guidance to. It's, it's not actually our primary mandate, um, but we think it's very important for research participants to have some resource to go to that is neutral, that can help explain to them what their rights are, what they can expect from research. So this is a bigger undertaking because, uh, again, it has to cover all kinds of research, not just people undergoing clinical trials for uh, medical conditions, but people who might be participating in sociological surveys, etc. So it's a big undertaking, and that group has, been, we call it the Research Participant Education Subcommittee, and they have been uh, uh, working away for about a year. Um, so that, that will, um, their work, the first product of their work, not necessarily the only product, will be a standalone uh, module or a, an online resource that you can just click on to and it's going to be a little bit like Wikipedia. It's not going to be very linear, but there will be aspects of it that you can click on to if you're particularly interested in clinical trials and what that's about. So that's what we've got in mind. Um, and uh, I'm sure there can be a, 
one aspect of that that may be specific to indigenous uh, research. Uh, we have, uh, this is just a kind of list of things we have done. Um, early on when we first launched TCPS2, we conducted a series of regional workshops across the country and those were really important. Nothing really replaces face-to-face um, -face contact, I, I have to say. We, we learn so much about what is the reality on the ground of how people are using and interpreting uh, the document and where it's helpful and where it's not helpful. Um, we can't, it's a big country and uh, we're a fairly small office, but we still try to respond to, we still try and go out to conferences and um, respond to requests from uh, individual REVs. And I know there are some people in this room whose institutions we've visited. Sometimes if we're invited to a place, we will say, yeah, we will come if you, um, if it's not just for your institution, but for everyone in your region, and that's often a good opportunity for uh, institutions in a region to kind of get together and um, and hear from each other uh, what problems they're facing, and that's often interesting. Um, so just some conferences that, that we've been to, I just tried to select ones that had particular perhaps resonance with this. We developed a specific case study when we were invited to go uh, to the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network uh, conference. Um, and the case studies that we have developed, if people asked us, can we use these for our own teaching? And absolutely, any, any of the resources that we've developed, we absolutely share um, freely. Uh, most of them are online. Some of them, like the case studies, may not be, but um, uh, they're certainly there for you. And um, I just want to give, as an entree to Kevin's um, presentation, we have certainly been aware that, oh, I got the yellow. I wanted you to feel, you know, important. <laughs> Um, and obviously Kevin will be talking to you more and, uh, about the initiative that, and the wonderful product that's coming out of the work uh, being done there by it. And, um, and the other way that we can help is, uh, so a lot of stuff we do ourselves, but then we'd like to support. Uh, we do have a, a limited um, fund of grant money and we try to use it to support other educational initiatives. So often it's just because people have the gumption to come to us. Uh, we don't necessarily do a lot of outreach. We don't have a formal um, sort of request for proposal uh, thing like the like the main funding agencies do. Um, so we kind of are, are reactive, which is not necessarily good, as um, my colleagues keep telling me. But um, it does mean that we are sometimes able to support initiatives that come to our attention. And obviously, Catherine will be talking to you about a very uh, interesting one. And we participated in both the planning of and um, and, and some of one of my colleagues, uh, actually a presenter, at this at the pilot project for uh, Carleton University's initiative, which Catherine will be telling you about. And I, so um, that's all I'm going to say. And obviously, we would welcome suggestions. That little reminder there is um, not just for suggestions that you might wish to give us today, but um, please feel free if you have ideas or if if there are initiatives that you are doing in your institutions or, um, um, I was going to say community organizations, but I think I'm, I'm constrained in funding only eligible inst institutions that are eligible for agency funds, but often there are partnerships and ways of doing that. So I'm just putting that idea in your heads to, um, to think about us as a potential, we, we don't have tons of funding, but um, elegant editing, and so send us your requests, and we might send you money. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Susan, and um, not only for your presentation, but also for um, being here and being a part and listening, because you sit in a, in a very important institution, um, and you are one of those people within an institution who you know, can um, be a part of this collective experience and then go back to that institution and um, have and, and continue and foster those openings. So, thank you. Next, um, I'll turn to Dr. Catherine Graham from Carleton, and she is going to talk about a very exciting initiative that's uh, going on at Carleton. Her talk is entitled Building Connections to Foster Ethical Research Through the 
Carleton University Institute on the Ethics of Research with Indigenous Peoples. Curip. How's that? <laughs> uh, thank you very much, uh, Kelly. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the fact that I'm honored to uh, be here and to speak in the unceded uh, territory of the Musqueam and Coast Salish. I'd also like to thank the organize, organizers of this amazing conference. I think uh, you know there's just a tremendous vibe in the room, and people really are working together in a good way. And it's one of those conferences where I personally am going to say, "Gee, it's over. It's really." We should go on, uh, and it will go on through the aftermath. But well, congratulations and thank you to the organizers. <clears throat> I have to also thank the weather gods. <laughs> I live in eastern Ontario. <clears throat> and there was a big red band across my computer screen this morning that said extreme cold warning. Uh, so thank you, weather gods. Uh, I did not do a PowerPoint. Partly because I knew I was really going to enjoy watching people <laughs> and, and I thought that perhaps it would be a little refreshing just to have someone talk. And so I'm just going to talk. But I'm going to talk about the origins of what is now the Carleton University uh, Institute for Ethical Research uh, with Indigenous Peoples, or CURIP, which is what we're going to be calling it. Uh, I'm going to give you a bit of background about how CURIP uh, got to the stage, what we're trying to do. Uh, with CUREP. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we face in developing it and making it live because this is not a one-time deal. Uh, we want to be in this for the long haul. Uh, and um, then give you a little information about where we're going. From. <coughs> so uh, just in terms of background, um, I'll elaborate a little bit more in a minute, but the idea uh, for CUREP really came uh, at one of those magic moments, I guess the particles were dancing, uh, where my university was connecting with the community. Uh, in particular, uh, the community of Algonquin, uh, Mohawk, and urban-based Aboriginal organizations and people and students that Carlton interacts with uh, by virtue of its, uh, its, its location on um, unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, in uh, Canada's capital. So that was really crucial, the, the idea of coming together just at the moment to, to have this idea. Uh, the second thing that was crucial was that we are very fortunate indeed in having TCPS 2, Chapter 9. And it's a long time uh, in the making, but it's a true foundation for the work that we are doing at CURA, along with other key documents like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, and other materials that have been uh, developed el elsewhere. But I think the, the fact that, that we do have Chapter 9 in Canada um, has really enabled us to, to take those dancing particles and move it forward into something that is an on-the-ground reality. So what I'm going to be talking to you about for the rest of my time is an on-the-ground reality. And if you doubt that I'm speaking the truth, there's another Catherine Graham in this room <laughs> <laughs> who also knows that it was an on-the-ground reality and continues. So just yes. go to the other Catherine Graham. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge uh, not only the contribution of TCBS uh, Chapter 9 to our work at Carleton, but also the support of the Secretariat for uh, re the responsible conduct of research. We did have the gumption and we were successful, so I encourage everyone in the room to <laughs> get up and go. <laughs> Sorry, Susan. <laughs> um, CURIP has been developed uh, since 2013 using what I would describe as an organic model of engagement within my own university, Carleton, uh, with communities uh, and with researchers and with the tri-councils, um, most notably uh, with SHRC uh, and with CIHR, as well as with the Secretariat for uh, the Responsible Conduct of Research. What is the goal of CURIP? Its goal is to foster the responsible conduct of research related to the needs of Indigenous peoples in Canada primarily, although we have global aspirations, 
um, through a training experience for settler researchers, for indigenous peoples, that engages them toward thinking well about good research ethics and to facilitate the practice of good research ethics with indigenous peoples. So our objective is really to raise awareness about ethical considerations when conducting research with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples. And the very idea of, of creating awareness, I think, is, is important as some of the discussion in the plenary and in the breakout groups um, has, has shown. Here we perhaps understand. This is not a universal understanding. And so we are working with the premise that there are people who are going to be doing research with Indigenous peoples who are starting with very little understanding of culture, of experience, aspiration, of ways, uh, and that it's important to begin uh, developing that understanding so that researchers do good practice. The second objective of CURIP is to engage everyone in the process. So this is an intensive uh, experience. People come together at Carleton uh, now for one week. And our intention is that community people, uh, people who are working on research within the academy, both faculty and students, people who are researchers in community-based research organizations, um, and others who are interested in uh, indigenous knowledge come together for a, an intense um, inquiry about what is good practice in doing research with indigenous peoples. And so we are attempting to build a, a bridge in our own way um, to integrate traditional and academic knowledge methodologies and pedagogies within the CURIP curriculum so that we can ensure that the research that is done by participants is respectful and of the highest ethical standards. So how do we go about developing CURIP? As I said, it was the particles dancing, uh, specifically at a meeting of the Aboriginal Education Council, which many of you will be familiar with. Uh, virtually every post-secondary institution in Ontario has one. And the intention of these councils is to bring uh, the academy together with uh, the uh, Aboriginal community, defined uh, variously, and students, to guide the <coughs> university's uh, work uh, in the field of uh, education and, and research. So the idea was hatched at a Carlton AEC meeting, and it was like magic. Someone said, you know, <laughs> there are some real problems around good research. And everyone said, we could do something about this. And there was instant agreement uh, among the senior uh, administrators from the university in the room uh, and the community people who were in the room that not only could we do something, but that we should do something. And so I had the honor of uh, being tasked, because of course in the university people do get tasked with things. Um, but it was an honor for me uh, to be asked to, uh, from the Carlton perspective, coordinate the development of uh, what was initially a summer institute, but we're now not restricting ourselves to the seasons. So hence we have CURIP. Um, and we, we convened um, a development uh, group. First of all, we did a consultation, uh, a broad consultation about the merits of this, and indeed we were told that this would be a, a, a valuable um, initiative. And then we convened um, a very eclectic uh, organizing group. And this group has been not only eclectic, it's been elastic. So it has grown. Um, and it's never shrunk, it's always grown as we've been moving along. So for example, um, last summer we did a pilot, and at the conclusion of the pilot, there were a number of people who participated in the pilot that are now part of the development committee because they wanted to be. 
Um, and so, of course, what else would you do? Um, and we worked um, in terms of everything from what does this thing look like, what will we call, to uh, what should be the curriculum. And the curriculum is based on the idea of the life cycle of research. And so we decided early on that it was not about the research project, it was about the life cycle of commitment to working with indigenous peoples and indigenous communities. And as everyone in this room will know, and as we've already discussed, the life cycle is much more than the project. Right? And so this has uh, this has really informed what we've done and, and informed the curriculum. We ran a, a pilot last uh, summer, a three-day pilot. We tested the curriculum. The other Catherine Graham could tell you. Uh, what it was like, uh, but by and large, I, I would say it was very successful. We received some extremely helpful feedback, and as a result, we uh, have been working diligently to explicitly um, incorporate um, the, the experiences and the, and the intent of research uh, with First Nations, Métis and Inuit people, um, and we are working to um, establish this coming year's um, uh, institute, which will be the first, we hope, of many. Uh, this is an annual uh, initiative that will happen at Carleton. Um, the first full cure will be occurring in June of this year, specifically June 8th to the 12th. It coincides with another major uh, Indigenous event uh, at Carleton, and that is the launch of the Indigenous Policy and Administration concentration in our graduate program. Um, in public policy administration, which we're also very proud of. Uh, so we are quite energized by this. We're energized by the process of developing it. We're energized by the results of our pilot. Um, and we're ex enthusiastically looking forward to this as a hallmark of Carlton's commitment to doing uh, good work in the field of um, indigenous life and indigenous uh, research. We have ongoing issues, of course. Money. Right? Money. And one of our intentions is that those who should be there are there. And that means people from across Canada, students, uh, people who cannot necessarily afford to pay the freight on their own to participate in something like this. And so we are uh, seeking support from various sources. Um, and of course, in seeking that support, we have to be mindful of the guidance that we are given in terms of, uh, of, of getting funding in a good way. But this is a, an ongoing issue um, that I'm sure we will overcome. How eloquent an ending can that be? We will overcome. <laughs> but um, in terms of uh, further information, there's an information sheet that's in, in the uh, Modern Art Gallery. My commentary is a little more organized and will be posted on the, uh, the website. Um, and I'll draw your attention to our website uh, for CURIP, which is uh, the Carlton website backslash Indigenous Research Ethics. And that's all you need to type in once you've got to Carlton. Uh, and that website will be launched on March 1st. Uh, and you can learn more, and you can even register for CURE. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we turn to Dr. Karine Jolet from the University of Montreal. And um, Karine, as well as other colleagues, have been involved in assembling um, a very um, um, important kind of tool, a toolbox of principles for research in Indigenous contexts. So we're really delighted that Karine was able to adjust her schedule to come to the I'm very glad to be here. Honestly, I feel like I found my, you know, my soulmates. Uh, sometimes it, it's quite hard to work on ethic issue uh, um, in the East. I should say that. And uh, so I'm, it's really a tremendous meeting for for, for me. And, and I will uh, talk about that with my colleagues when I will be back in the snow and and the wind and the ice and <laughs> tonight. Uh, what I will present today uh, is uh, the, the, what, the project that we are working on uh, for the last two years. 
Uh, in fact, uh, my my kids uh, tell me that my presentation sucked because it was <laughs> gray, black, and white. So I put some colors. <laughs> I hope you will enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> and tell me so I can tell them. Uh, so, okay, so um, in this uh, project, uh, we are three, three people, uh, and I want to introduce you uh, to them because they are really important. Uh, they are friends, first of all, but also uh, uh, colleagues also involved in uh, ethic issue. Nancy Gorui McHugh is a research pro uh, manager at the Health and Social Services Commission of First Nation of Quebec and Labrador. And she's working, she's doing research in a non-academic uh, uh, environment, and she's doing research with communities, okay? Nancy is a PhD candidate in environmental studies, I think so, and uh, she's a uh, scholar, she's from, uh, uh, Nancy is uh, from uh, First Nation Huron wendat and uh, uh, Susie is uh, from, uh, she, she's at Ikamek. And Susie is working with communities, but also with scholars. And she's in charge of um, a seminar uh, uh, which is held every year at the Université uh, du Québec en Témiscamingue uh, institution on ethical issue. And they are very proactive. And uh, for my opinion, they are the leader on ethical issue in Quebec. And uh, myself. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a, the, the coalition. It's a statement because. You know, uh, uh, Nancy is working with community, uh, Susie is, co is working with um, uh, community and scholars, and I'm working with uh, 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 scholars and NGOs. So we have three kind of expertise and three <coughs> kind of need to address. So this, uh, this was important when we uh, start to think about the, the, the toolbox. And also we have three institutions behind us. Uh, the research center where I'm uh, working on, on public law, um, and uh, uh, the commission, you have the, the, the sign, UCAT, and also the, the fourth one is uh, the dialogue network. Uh, we had an issue at some point uh, because we wanted um, the toolbox to be in French and in English, which means that we have to translate all, all the contribution that we receive in English or in French in the other language, with its tremendous uh, um, uh, money. So dialogue help us on that, and I'm very glad, so I wanted to, to mention it. <coughs> Um, about, um, uh, okay, I want to, to uh, first, um, I want to, to explain our, you know, our methodology and our approach, uh, and it's uh, only for Quebec, okay? I know that there is a, there, maybe there is some issue elsewhere in Canada, but we, we base our observation and, and the need that we have to address on Quebec. In fact, in, we, we, the three of us uh, never saw any reference tool on ethic issue, you know, uh, uh, like a, a handbook when you can have all the, the, the information that you want, or online, there is nothing. Also in Quebec, and, and especially in social sciences, which exclude Pierre, because he is, um, I think he's very open mind about, uh, about uh, uh, ethics, but, uh, you know, ethical principles are always seen as administrative constraint on you know a bureaucratic thing so they don't want you to be involved with also uh, and it was a regret for Nancy you know uh, communities uh, need to to be teach about uh, the kind of protocol that they can work with and you know and some 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 communities are very well organized they have a people uh, like a person who received the request of the researcher, but some are not, so they are they are feeling sometimes kind of overwhelmed. And also, uh, I was mentioning about the reluctance and resistance to use protocols and and memorandum of understanding uh, uh, inside the, the the community research community. And I just want to mention uh, in that in that PowerPoint, and is it the same for my colleagues? When we say researcher, we mean academic researcher and non-academic researcher. I know that there is an issue that we have talked yesterday, but you know, uh, uh, we don't do the differences between uh, academic and non-academic. And also, uh, you know, we identify that we have a, um, a need of education for students. And at first, our will was to uh, disseminate uh, the toolbox uh, when you have a, a course on indigenous issue, indigenous. I, I I want to make the difference. When you have a, a, a course on, on you know indigenous issue, uh, we wanted the toolbox to be uh, to be uh, distributed. Uh, yeah. But uh, you know we we 
we have no phones, so <laughs> it won't be possible at that time. Maybe if we have some funding, I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, up here. <laughs> you open the door. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but we need to, to do some education. Okay, about the audience. We want the largest audience as possible. Uh, so this is a teacher, researcher, uh, a university ethics office, and, and as soon as the, the, the toolbox will be uh, online, I will send to everybody that I know in university and research the, the URL that I don't know yet. Um, and, and to, to be put on their website. Also, research center, indigenous research center, non-indigenous research center, you know, everybody that we know, every, uh, and also uh, First Nation institution, and Ben Council, of course. Okay, the, our toolbox, of course, we want it to be a reference tool. Uh, um, uh, we want to, to strengthen the, 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 the community capacities, we want to, uh, uh, to equip people, so uh, the toolbox, um, uh, we wanted the toolbox to be fun, to be uh, interactive, to be not a, a written publication, but something, something very uh, uh, simple to, to, to work with. So we put a, a lot of money, in fact, on design, and uh, we ask especially contributors to, when they wrote a paper, to put to put some design in it, you know, we help them, but uh, we really ask to have a, a, a very uh, a fun and simple uh, uh, documentation. Am I okay, uh, Your Honor? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and also we want to gather data on one site, which is the primary uh, uh, goal that we want to achieve. And also, I, I want to this sum up what uh, our, you know, our um, vision of ethic for us and the three of us which is you know ethics is first first of all it's a human relationship in, in the research process for, for, for us it's a non-negotiable it's a research uh, it's a human relationship and also uh, by doing this toolbox we want to to propose new research pathway, you know, and, and we want to, to give access because, you know, Nancy, Susie and I have worked with researcher, I worked with community, we have heard a lot of stuff about ethics, uh, we get frustrated, you, we get, you know, sometimes we don't want to hear any more about ethics and we wrote, we work on that and we say, okay, now it's time to take action. So what we can propose, what we, we can do to, to help people to say, okay, you have a problem, take this and look at this. Maybe you can find some solutions. So uh, this is the kind of, of philosophy that we are working uh, with. Also, I want to acknowledge that uh, uh, the, the, the toolbox is part of a larger movement of, uh, of uh, reaffirmation and self-determination, and it's clear for us that we want to uh, we want to be part of that. And maybe in Quebec, the first uh, the first step of this uh, self-determination movement is the research protocol of the AFMQL. You have the map of the last version in 2014. Uh, there's a with the text, you have like a poster you can put on your on your walls. It's it's uh, sum up all the, the the processes. The first research pro uh, protocol was la launched in 2005, and Nancy was the one meeting the research uh, office in university and and <coughs> try to convince them to to use it. It was a, you know she's a fighter. She's a sweet lady, but she's a fighter. Trust me. <laughs> and uh, so. This was the first step for, for us, and also in Quebec, uh, most there is a lot of uh, yes, okay, you uh, There is a lot of um, of uh, research on uh, uh, women and uh, domestic violence, and uh, the Native uh, Quebec uh, Association, uh, Femmes Autochtones du Québec, uh, wanted to launch uh, guidelines to protect women that are involved in uh, in uh, research. Uh, so this is the guidelines. And Susie is uh, the one who wrote the, the, the guidelines. Okay, this is our toolbox. Uh, toolbox sorry. And uh, in fact, this is our first project. We wanted to have a, 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 a set box with uh, CDs. But as we went out of money, <laughs> we decided to print only tw uh, 2,000 of these. And we will send it to Bell Council and to... Uh, 
some you know communities that really need that first and then it will be put online on the website of the commission because you know the commission is the most legitimate institution that could uh, as they are doing some research um, and it's uh, an indigenous uh, institution they are the more legitimate uh, to, to have it on their website um, so it's free uh, and also uh, the online version with will allow us to uh, update the, the publication and to, to add some, some more material. You see that we have three categories. We have videos, we have like existing protocols, we did an inventory of all the protocols and MOU that exist. Uh, for example, chapter 9 is here, you have the guidelines for women, you have also the UN declaration, you have a, a Nagoya protocol, you know, all the, the kind of stuff. Um, and I ask you for your collaboration, because we did this, this inventory with our own means, resources, which means it's quite limited. So if there is any, you know, initiatives or protocol, public protocol that you think would be useful to be, uh, to be in the toolbox, please feel free to send us. Yes, I will finish it, I don't think. Uh, uh, so, and also the, the three categories maybe we will be, you know, it's, it's the first first version of the toolbox, so maybe it will be um, a, a fourth category, I don't know. This is some, some uh, uh, page setting that you will find. Each of the categories has its own uh, uh, identity, color identity. Okay, and that's it. If you have any question, feel free to contact us. And also, if you want to help us, we need money, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but also, please share when when it will be. It has already been <coughs> launched. It, it, even if the, the toolbox is not finishing, it will be online. I hope beginning of March, and then the the URL will be uh, uh, available for everybody. So. Please free to share. It's free. It's convenient. You will be able to download all the material. So I need. We, we need your help. Thank you so much. Um, lastly, we have uh, Dr. Sean Haynes um, uh, in terms of our presentation. Uh, indigenous education and a new intelligence is found. And I just want to refer you to, there's a handout in your um, presentation and packages that uh, Sean provided for us. Thank you. I'm going to share something that will go deep within our Aboriginal people today. So uh, if you could prepare yourself. Um, as I was teaching, I came to realize, that one minute I'm saying, what race is that whale? What race is that eagle? But sometimes we are Native North American. This was a Native North American time. I, in my naivety, did not know that other races did not know how to teach special ed. I did not know that we were the first and longest history in working with gifts. A colleague of mine who works with autism said, Sean, we have data and artifacts going back 8,000 years. I said, I didn't know other people didn't. I didn't know that. That is a truth of who we are. Another truth of who we are is an enormously long history in the teachings of peace. That is a truth. Between 1492 and the proclamation of 1763 were hundreds, well, maybe a bit over 100 to 200 years of peaceful, fair trade. Where in the history of the world did that take place before? We have truth within ourselves. As I began to teach students with special needs, I just need the next slide, I think. Yeah, we'll leave it there. One of the things that came up with 50% of the kids being Native was how do you teach gifts? How do you allow youth with gifts to share? As I did that, students from Afghanistan 
and China. Their reading scores on practice diplomas went up 20 to 70 percent. I have no idea why. I don't come from that history. That's something I don't understand. But there are skills within us that we don't always share. What happened was 100% success with students with severe conduct disorder for six years in a row. And they were multicultural. A student with autism came wandering in and picked up the drumstick and sat down and drummed together with the others. He belonged. When I teach, other races learn. I didn't know that about ourselves. I didn't know that was new. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw in circles. I'm going to teach you in a native way how to write Shakespeare. Because it works. How do I explain it? I can't. When we looked at their IQ testing, there was no indicator. It is tactile, spatial, creative, and the student has voice. That's, those are the only indicators I can find. I phoned downtown central office and I said, what do we do? These kids are getting 100%. We have no indicator. So I said, ah, forget it, we'll just teach. But we have a type of intelligence we can't measure. What do we do? Next slide, I'll do, I'll do it quickly because it's scary. When we realize this, what's the impact on law, on health, on education, on advanced education and work? If the native, native North American people don't speak, our world suffers. We're only coming to see ourselves in the world. We are humble people, many. We like to share, but we don't know we're that different, or do we? How did we unfold differently so that we always protected our special gifted ones. We are the only peoples in the history of the world with that history. It defines us. We are not the same. When we teach students from other races and backgrounds learn faster. Why? I haven't got a clue. The only way I can do it is let you come, try it, and maybe you can figure it out. But the results speak for themselves. I have witnessed nine years of perfect student results. They're telling me something. But I don't know what to do with it. There are nine years of truth of our youth speaking. Thank you. Willie, I wanted to offer you the mic if you have something to share with us. I'll give you a test one to CPS home. First time, 1998. 1998. I was in... Uh, New Zealand at that time, a bioethics conference, and, and uh, we presented the, this new document. And when we got back, uh, we were sitting with, uh, I don't think it's the governing council, but uh, Elaine Baudet, Baudet was, was there. Uh, it, it, it might have been the governing council, but um, uh, they were talking about the TCPS, and, and there I congratulated the governing council. Uh, what I found out in New Zealand, I told them, was that uh, Canada is the only country that that uh, has uh, uh, such a document as this pertaining to Indigenous peoples. And, and I told the governing council, I, I'm really proud of what, what Canada did. Uh, 
Uh, that was, of course, in anticipation that there would be a, a growth uh, beyond beyond, uh, beyond approving the document itself, and that's certainly what we've seen. That uh, that's that's what happened. So that that's a preamble. Uh, I, I won't take it. I won't take too much time. I told you yesterday I was a lazy person. And my notes kind of reflect that. Uh, I only have one, two, three, four, four words on my, my uh, as far as notes go. And I was looking closer at them. Uh, one, one says ant, A N T. I don't know if I'm influenced by Sam's drawings here, but um, ant came up. That's one of the notes I made, and I think it's it's relative to this uh, discuss ant. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's probably where it came from. So, uh, uh, but nevertheless, I, I feel I feel like uh, an ant uh, because of the uh, we, we can we still have not looked at the whole world of ethics. Of course, we can't do that. Uh, but certainly, I think uh, perhaps as with you, uh, we're overwhelmed by such it's a vast world you know it's very expansive and it's also very inward you know we're not only going out uh, physically into the out outdoor world of Canada and society but also at the same time as uh, as uh, these beautiful illustrations can attest it's a very inward journey that we're we're exploring uh, the other one that I have is uh, uh, enterprise uh, when when I was writing about the ethical space, of what what I envisioned at that time, and why did, what I did say was that this is a, a brand new enterprise that's going to have to happen, and I think um, you you certainly get a picture of that. I think a, a feel of that that it is an enterprise. You know that the uh, the presenters talked about the education process, and and I think it was at Meal Olivia we were talking about as an enterprise. It, It'll have uh, perhaps uh, as a core uh, this idea of the ethical space, and 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 uh, and it, it it will branch off into different areas. And education, of course, is one one big area for students. Uh, so it branches off, and um, also uh, that as an enterprise, I think, and and as a university activity or or practice or. Um, a tradition, uh, it'll have a research chair, much like a research chair. It'll, it'll have its own chair. The enterprise will have a chair. And Olivia would be the first uh, chair of the ethical space. So, uh, but as an enterprise, we can certainly see that it, it goes into it to many different directions. And, and uh, it, it, you know, it talks about a lot of ideas that need a home, and I think a, a lot of the illustrations uh, show us that there are so many ideas out there, and, and Kelly and uh, Kelly and the colleagues have uh, done a really good job of, 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 of centering it into um, uh, centering it and, and, and having a discussion from that space. The other note I wrote here is a wagon. I'm not sure a wagon is supposed to do, but I think it refers to this idea. Somebody mentioned uh, having fun, having fun, and I, I think that this is a wagon uh, that if we, if you create a, a discourse, a, a, a dialogue that is so so enticing, so much fun, and so creative, and, and people want to come on board. And I think that's uh, part of the discussion we had, Kelly, in the beginning, is that if we can have, uh, create, create a dialogue and a discussion that is uh, uh, enterprising and forward-looking and, and very positive, and it, it does a dialogue in very positive terms, and that uses people's energy, positive energies, to, if, we, if we can have this wagon, and, and if we can pronounce it through the enterprise, then, then perhaps we have more people that will come on board. Because I can tell you, going back to 1998, we did not have meetings like this and talking about these ideas that have uh, advanced our thinking a little bit more. Where can we be in another 10 years? Where can we, you know, where can it go? Uh, so those are optimistic things that I've, I've been listening to 
and I certainly seen all of you. So, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I thank the Creator. Uh, our elders say you cannot thank anybody else except the Creator. So have to figure out, we have to figure out ways how you thank people then, if you can't thank them. Uh, so we, what we say is, Creator, I thank you for creating minds that we have meaning right here. So I thank the Creator for creating you to have a mind and a heart the way that you, that you operate. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, that was that was amazing. Thank you to all the presenters and to Willie for your contribution.